I'm going to start this by talking about something somewhat unrelated to the title of the video, W Series, the groundbreaking all-female racing series. Few series start their life under such scrutiny as this one did. It faced calls of segregation and isolating women from mainstream racing series. In being free to enter and running a field of identical cars, it has provided close competition for women looking to make a name for themselves in the world of motorsport. The grid is made up of cars based on the F3 specifications, and for the 2021 season, it will be acting as a support race at 8 F1 weekends, putting a grid of 20 incredible women on show at the pinnacle of motorsport. But wind the clock back, and women have been on the grid before at F1 weekends, and not just holding umbrellas. The race weekend in question is the 27th of April, 1975. The Formula One circus has arrived at the Montjuïc street circuit, southwest of Barcelona, for its fourth round. There has been a two-month gap between racing at Kyle Army and the Spanish Grand Prix, and the drivers were itching to get back on track. But the track in question wasn't up to scratch. The Grand Prix Drivers Association was outraged that the circuit was in such a shocking state. The barriers around the track weren't bolted together, and where they were, there were gaps. The bolts were worn or just finger tight. So the drivers went on strike. The association drivers and many others set out the practice sessions, and the following evening track staff set about working on the barriers to improve the situation. Some teams even sent their mechanics out to help the process, but the drivers were unconvinced by the bodge job and threatened to sit out the race, although this was overturned when the race organisers threatened them with legal action if no race went ahead. This and rumours that the Guardia Seville would seize the cars which were in the paddock, which was actually at the Montjuï Stadium, and this forced the drivers to call off the strike. Defending champion Emerson Fittipaldi was furious at all this, and when qualifying started he set out, set three slow laps, and then pulled into the pits. Following this he announced he wouldn't be partaking in the race, and promptly went home. Meanwhile, on race morning, Tyrrell team boss Ken Tyrrell headed out onto track with a spanner to check that the Spaniards had improved the state of the safety barriers. The race eventually got underway, with Nicky Lauda and Clay Regazzoni starting from the front row, but then it all started to unwind. Vittorio Brambilla's march came into contact with Mario Andretti's Parnelli. Andretti would collect Lauda and his Ferrari, who would subsequently take out his teammate Clay Regazzoni. Through the resultant chaos, James Hunt made it to pole. Regazzoni slunk back into the pits for repairs before heading out once more. P7 starter Patrick Depaye would also retire on the first lap because of suspension damage. Wilson Fittipaldi and Arturo Mazzario withdrew in protest. Once the melee at turn 1 cleared, Hunt was in pole and Andretti was somehow still on track and running in P2. John Watson was in third, Rolf Stommelen was fourth, Brambia fifth, and Carlos Pace sixth, rounding out the points positions. On lap four, the Ford engine in Jody Schechter's Tyrrell stopped being an engine and pretended to be the Exxon Valdez, dumping oil onto the circuit. This caused Alan Jones and Mark Donoghue to crash. Three laps later, Hunt also slipped in the oil and crashed as well. The top three had now become Andretti, Watson, and Stommelen. Watson's car suffering from vibrations due to the rough track eventually dropped out. Andretti's rear suspension lasted only seven more laps before it failed, causing him to crash out of the lead. Jean-Pierre Jarrier and Brambier stopped to change tyres, while Tom Price and Tony Bryce tangled. Hill driver Rolf Stommelen was now in the top spot, followed by Pace, Ronnie Peterson, Jochen Mass, and Jackie Ix. On lap 24, Peterson was out after he tangled with Francois Migo, Stommelen's teammate, while trying to lap the Frenchman. Two laps later, yet another tragedy struck. The rear wing on Stommelen's Embassy Hill broke, sending him into the barrier, unironically, at the point that his team's mechanics had worked on. He bounced off it and back onto the racing line, skittering across the track, finally hitting the barrier on the other side, flying over it. While trying to avoid Stommelen as he crossed the track, Pace crashed behind him. Four people were killed by Stommelen's flying car, fireman Joaquin Benarchez Moreira, spectator Andres Ruiz Villanova, and two photojournalists, Mario de Roya and Antonio Fontbayara. Stommelen was fairly fortunate, suffering a broken leg, a broken wrist, and two cracked ribs in the accident. Strangely enough, the race wasn't black flagged at this point, and continued for another four laps, during which Mass passed X for the lead. On lap 29, the race was halted, with Mass declared the winner. X second, Jean-Pierre Jarrier crossed the line in third position, Carlos Reutemann finished 4th ahead of Brambilla in 5th, and in 6th, rounding up the points finishers, Maria Lombardi. 
making her the only woman in Formula 1 history to score championship points. Although the racing being black flagged before the three quarters had been run, half points were awarded. This also gave Lombardi the award of being the only F1 driver to have a career points tally of half a point, a record setting woman in the top flight of motorsports. Records that have yet to be broken, but where did Lombardi come from? Born in Fugarolo in northwestern Italy in 1941, her father was a butcher which gave her her first driving experience behind the wheel of the delivery van. After a brief experience karting, she bought her first race car in 1965 and raced in Formula Monza. Formula Monza was the step before Formula 3 at the time really. The cars were simply a chassis with a basic fiberglass body and the running gear from a Fiat 500. The lightweight engine and transaxle gearbox lent themselves well to the series and provided some agile race cars, giving strong competition on the shorter track at the Monza circuit. After racing in Formula Monza, Lombardi moved on to Italian Formula 3 in 1968, where she finished the series in second place, a fair position to take in a tightly packed grid, so she had some racing chops, that really can't be doubted at this point. In 1970 she raced a Biraghi in the Italian Formula 850 series. Lombardi won four of the ten races in the calendar and won the championship overall. In 1971 we saw Lombardi move to the UK, where she won the Formula Ford Mexico championship. Then in 1974 she raced in Formula 5000 with an Eagle Chevrolet, regularly finding herself in the top 10 by the chequered flag, wrapping up the season in 5th place. Lombardi finally debuted in Formula 1 in 1974 with a privately entered Brabham, supported by the Italian Automobile Club, but failed to qualify. In 1975 she was invited to join Vittorio Brambilla and Hans Joachim Stuck at March, and raced the full, albeit tumultuous and troubled season for the team. At the opening race of the campaign in South Africa, Lombardi became the first woman since Maria Teresa de Felipe's in 1958 to successfully qualify for a Grand Prix. Her race lasted for 23 laps until she was forced to retire with a fuel system problem. The season rolled on until Spain where she would collect her half a championship point and write her name into the record books. Her next best result would be a 7th place finish at the German Grand Prix later that season, and don't snub that as a seventh of seven drivers, she finished unlapped and ahead of three other ranked drivers who completed the 14 laps around the Nürburgring. March co-founder and designer Robin Hurd called this her best drive, better than in Spain. That's the one I remember. Quietly impressive. It was much better than her Montjuï performance. She wasn't one of those tossers that arrive in Formula 1 from time to time. She wasn't there to make up the numbers. We knew what she'd done beforehand, and clearly she was very capable. Racing in an era where just keeping your car in one piece until the checkered flag was considered a strong result, Formula One had unwittingly shown itself to be a level playing field regardless of gender. Competing and finishing with the big names of Lauda, Mass, Fittipaldi, Schechter, Peterson, Watson, Andretti, Lombardi proved that all you needed to do was to be a good driver. Her skills on the track were enough to catch the eye of Frank Williams, who offered her a seat in the FW04 for the US Grand Prix at Watkins Glen. Although, again, fate wasn't going to play fairly. A rough qualifying with limited practice time saw Lombardi struggle to get a competitive time, and then on race day the ignition packed up on her car, resulting in a misfire. The Williams team rushed to get her into Jacques Lafitte's car, as he had retired having put visor cleaner into his eyes instead of eye drops but she was unable to fit into the car due to her 5 foot 2 inch frame being too small and so failed to start the race. Lombardi raced in the 1976 F1 season for March and Ram Racing with limited success. She would find success, although in a different discipline, racing at the 24 hours of Le Mans that year, racking up 265 laps in a Lancia Stratos alongside her teammate Christine Dacremont as part of an all-female team, placing 20th overall but second in their class no mean feat at all. This all sounds very positive, and overall it is from what I could find. In the F1 world, her sex and sexuality as a gay woman were not topics of conversation in the paddock. She was judged purely as a racing driver by her fellow drivers, but there were a few instances of her gender coming as a hindrance. She had been off the pace of her teammate at March and complained of the car falling over on corner exit and suffering from perpetual understeer after an accident in a Monaco practice session. Technically minded and an adept mechanic, she knew what she was on about, although hampered by her language skills. 
The team disregarded this somewhat, something manager Hurd looks back on with a level of disdain. Her teammate Ronnie Peterson was given a new chassis after a similar accident a year later, which remedied his issues and resulted in much more neutral handling. This prompted the engineers to look at Layla's March 751 from the previous season, and it was found to have a cracked chassis, resulting in that perpetual understeer. Nonetheless, she had raced around this and still proved a competitive and qualified driver. She held herself well and led an almost drab life compared to the playboy lifestyle of many of her male contemporaries. She stayed in Italy most of the time and flew to each race, yet never asked for expenses. Robin Hurd said that she was a woman was an irrelevancy to Maria. She was a racing driver first and foremost. She was very professional and we enjoyed working with her. The respect she earned in her field came to her as it did to any other driver, through proving herself on track. And while her fellow drivers were accepting, the press often was not. She found herself racing in the Daytona 400 in 1977, when asked in a press conference how she was coping with such a hefty car, she replied, I don't have to carry it, I just have to drive it. And drive it she did. Despite transmission issues, she outlasted her teammate, American Janet Guthrie, but eventually retired, being classified 31st out of a pack of 41, again racing against such giant names in the sport as Richard Petty and Darrell Waltrip. Lombardi would move on to the European touring car scene and race in DTM for two rounds as well, but by now her health was catching up with her. By 1985, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and continued racing despite having operations. She retired from racing in 1988 and set up her own team, Lombardi Autosport, the following year. She checked herself into Milan's San Camillo Clinic in February 1992 and died on the 3rd of March, days short of her 51st birthday. Small only in person, Maria's legacy is an enormous one, one that we've barely scratched the surface of here. She came onto the motor racing scene not with a bang, but with ferocious competence and determination, a style that would become her brand across the disciplines. The impact Lombardi made in the sport sent out ripples that we're seeing positive effects from today. Motorsport has seen growing numbers of women on the grid and off of it leading teams and driving them through development roles and engineering roles. Motorsport has improved in its diversity across the genders as time has progressed. W Series is set to continue to drive this diversity, something that can be seen as having been set in motion by one resolute driver. Maria Grazia Lea Lombardi made her point. Well, half a point.